24 years ago, our church family was considerably smaller than it is today. We had about 50, occasionally 60, meet with us on a Sunday morning for our church service. At that time, we took a huge step of faith for such a small church. We purchased a large plot of land adjacent to our church building. On this land, there were five derelict houses. Our intention was to turn this into a centre for community outreach, which we aptly named the Manor House. God provided the Israelites manna from heaven when they journeyed for 40 years through the Sinai Desert. And the Lord provided finance from heaven for us to purchase and renovate this site. It was about £350,000 in all. This was a mammoth project for such a small church that had so few resources. The Lord provided in quite remarkable ways and the buildings were completed in October 1996. We managed to pay all the bills and ongoing running costs were covered in the business plan. But then, <laughs> then I received an invoice that I wasn't expecting from one of our subcontractors. The invoice was for £10,000. Whilst we'd witnessed God provide for everything we needed for our project, this last bill floored me. It caught me spiritually flat-footed. I felt overwhelmed. We'd come so far, seen amazing answers to prayer, but for some reason I got tripped up by this last invoice and we had no money left to pay it. Julie will tell you that I paced up and down our lounge that evening and she made comment that I was wearing the carpet through. I just kept saying to her, we've come so far, but we've fallen at this last hurdle as we have no money left to pay this final bill. All was doom and gloom. To say the least, I was troubled. Uh, and I think that probably would have been an understatement. Isn't it strange how we can sometimes have such great faith for some things and then other challenges come along and they well and truly trip us up. Well, the following morning, I was going to break the news of this invoice to the rest of the leadership team, but decided to open my mail first. The first letter that I opened that morning contained a cheque from a trust fund that I'd applied to several months before. I'd forgotten that I'd even applied to them, and they hadn't given any indication that we'd been awarded anything from them. So this was a, a very pleasant surprise. And the cheque was for you probably guessed it, £10,000. The work of Nehemiah and his team in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem was completed. Yet the challenges continued. Nehemiah didn't have any late invoices come through the post. At least he doesn't tell us that he did. His challenge was the enemies, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of the motley crew. Walls rebuilt, work finished in just 52 days at that. Amazing. Yet opposition continues. Intimidation continues. Plots and scheming continue against Nehemiah. Plot one, let's kidnap him. Plot two, let's malign his character and destroy his integrity. Plot three, let's intimidate him and his people. Plot four, let's undermine his reputation. In Shakespeare's play Hamlet, Claudius pronounces, when sorrows come, they come not as single spies, but in battalions. And you might have experienced that truth in your lives too. How often do we say, it never rains until it pours. But the reason for Nehemiah's trials wasn't a stroke of bad luck. Rather, it was a concerted attack by his enemies. They came at him in a variety of ways. They were persistent, devious, scheming, untruthful, versatile in the way that they kept changing their tactics. They were also undeterred. They were not giving up on Nehemiah anytime soon. In the New Testament, we are told of an enemy who is the enemy of all that is good, the enemy of our souls. He is also devious, scheming, untruthful, versatile and persistent. Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. 
For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places, writes Paul. Many believe that language of demonic is rather archaic and outdated, has no place in our modern world, whilst there are many others who have ruined their lives through excessive and unhealthy interest in dark spiritual forces. And we do need care when we speak of these matters, but I would suggest that to ignore the spiritual battle that Jesus and other New Testament writers speak of would be an absolute mistake. Nehemiah knew his enemy. He wasn't naive or gullible. He had a wonderful God-given uh, discernment and he saw schemes for what they were. And it's also good for us, I believe, to know our enemy and his various guises. In scripture, he is spoken of as a serpent, a roaring lion, as the father of lies, as an accuser of Christians, and even one who masquerades as an angel of light. He is devious and hell-bent on undermining the work of God in our lives and in our world. But the good news is that we are not left unprotected against such tactics. We have weapons and armory that are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, writes Paul. Our weapons include truth and righteousness and faith and the word of God and prayer. Nehemiah writes in his memoirs that his enemies try to intimidate and frighten him. But then he writes, But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. I believe that he saw that behind his flesh and blood enemies there was a, a dark force, the enemy. His enemies did their worst. They slandered and threatened and accused. But Nehemiah prayed. William Cowper, the great hymn night writer of another generation, wrote, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Nehemiah chapter 6 is essentially a story about two things. It's a story of the enemy's strategies, but perhaps more importantly, it is also a story of the Lord's sufficiency, that we have a God who is on our side. The devil might be a roaring lion, but we have the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who breaks every chain on our side. One of the most su successful strategies that the devil has against Christians is lies. And in Revelation, the final book in the Bible, the devil is called the accuser of our brothers and sisters. You might have encountered that f those fiery arrows of accusation, lies and slander. They might have overwhelmed you at times. The accusing finger pointed in your direction, saying you're not good enough. You've failed too many times. God doesn't love you. You've sinned too deeply to ever be forgiven. Words of overwhelming, crushing condemnation, slanderous lies, to which we respond by the declaring the truth that there is no condemnation for those in Christ. And we respond by raising up our shield of faith, trusting in the promise of God's love. Jesus responded to the devil's temptation by quoting scripture, and so can we. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. One of the greatest weapons we have against the father of lies and accuser of our souls is truth. And as we conclude, let us prayerfully reflect on the truths of that great old hymn 
Say it out loud if it helps. Declare its truth and rejoice with me in our amazing God.